This is The Red Line, where we talk to three expert witnesses about one issue shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. It's crazy the difference five months can make. And here in 2020, five months can feel like a lifetime. In February, we did a piece on the Libyan civil war, why people were fighting over it, and what was at stake. And I highly recommend you check that out for more of the history of Libya, Gaddafi, and how we got here. When we put that out, Libya was split in two. The west side of the country was controlled by the GNA. The GNA are the UN-recognized government, a replacement to the decades of dictatorship rule under Muammar Gaddafi. They came to power after the Arab Spring of 2011 and held together some authority over the peoples of Libya. Supporting them at the time were the Turkish, the Italians, and to a lesser extent the French, who were playing both sides. In principle, they had the UN support, but in practice, many nations jumped behind their enemy in the east. A thousand kilometers to the east is the city of Benghazi, capital of the eastern provinces and a hub to a lot of the country's oil facilities. From Benghazi rose up an ex-Gaddafi subordinate, Khalifa Haftar, who himself believed he alone should rule all of Libya. Haftar made some very powerful friends in Russia, the Emirates, the Saudis, the French, and a handful of others all preferring a Haftar-controlled Libya for their own country's purposes. He raised a large army of Libyan tribesmen, Russian mercenaries, Chinese drones, and a whole lot of Syrian fighters, and quickly took control of the east of the country and declared his own government known as the House of Representatives. The GNA were in dismay and shocked by the momentum showed by Haftar, and it began to fall apart. And in the chaos, Haftar pushed his forces westwards, capturing the Libyan oil belt, the fortress city of Sirte, the tribal border of Misrata. Haftar seemed to have military victory after military victory. Even when countries like Russia called in for negotiated settlement, Haftar just brushed them aside and pushed on. City after city fell to the general, and he now occupied the majority of Libya. Haftar pushed so far in, he now sat his troops on the outer suburb of the country's capital, Tripoli, shelling the town in anticipation of a huge offensive to win the war once and for all. And that's where we left it last time, with Haftar having the wind in his sails and the preparatory artillery bombardments beginning what would be the prelude of the final battle for the future of Libya. But as I said, a lot can change in a few months. The GNA were given a lifeline in the form of huge last minute military support by the Turks. And when Haftar made his big push, he was crushed. He lost many of his men and with it control of the air as well. The GNA rallied and ejected Haftar by force from the city, going on to take back town after town whilst Haftar was on the run. They captured important towns like Tohuna, Komas, and then even Misrata. Even with all these nations supporting Haftar, he was still being beaten further and further back, retreating 500 kilometers all the way back to the middle of the country and the fortress city of Sirte. And that's where we sit today. The tables turned and the GNA sitting on the outskirts of a crucial Haftar-controlled city. But with so much blood and treasure spent on the war, many nations don't want to give up on their investments. Moscow, Abu Dhabi, and Cairo have drawn a red line in cert and have threatened to take the war to a whole new level if it were to fall. So the question today is, will the GNA make that big push into the city? Will Haftar be able to defend it? And will Moscow, Cairo, and Abu Dhabi make good on their promise to step in personally and throw the GNA back to Tripoli if cert was attacked? Well, to answer that, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. Choking on Success Within uh, Western capitals like uh, Washington, Paris, Berlin, there's been a tradition which has always consisted in uh, playing down the importance, the geostrategic importance of Libya. Jalil Hatchery is a senior research fellow at the Klingendel Institute, specializing in Libya. It's pretty hard to find anyone else in the world who knows more about Libya and its complicated past and present. And we're thrilled to have him back on the show. He joins us today. It's also connected through history uh, to Istanbul or Constantinople, which is effectively 
uh, the beginning of Asia. It's connected historically also to the to uh, uh, the the Arabian Gulf or the uh, uh, Arabian Peninsula, which is also uh, Western Asia. Uh, it has obviously a big uh, African component uh, because it's uh, the easiest passageway into the actual continent, and of course it's very 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 close uh, to Europe. I mean, if you look at the distance uh, between Libya and Italy and Malta, it's just a few hundred kilometers. And oil is not the only wealth. You also have iron ore, you have gold, you have diamond, uh, and God knows what else, because Qaddafi has uh, has had a history, had a history of hiding a lot of the wealth that he was aware of. So, uh, you know, technically you should immediately recognize that it's obviously a super important territory. But yet, from a diplomatic perspective, it was never considered as such. So last time we spoke, Haftar was at the gates of Tripoli, with victory right there in sight. What changed the direction of the war so dramatically as to where it sits today? Yeah, February was a uh, was a peculiar month, a peculiar month. But then again, every month has been peculiar over the last uh, fifteen or sixteen months. Um, the uh, the offensive that uh, Field Marshal uh, Haftar initiated. It was really his personal decision. It wasn't really the plan of his foreign backers. He decided to uh, go forcefully, uh, conduct a frontal assault uh, using a relatively uh, small armed coalition, not known for being very enthusiastic when it comes to fighting far away from home and risking their lives away uh, from home. And he attacked effectively uh, because it, technically it's an aggression. You know, even if you can discuss maybe the political opinion of the population inside downtown Tripoli, that's a separate question. But to get into the downtown area of Tripoli, you have to uh, deploy a lot of violence if you're not welcome. And that uh, involves uh, killing people. Um, and, uh, and effectively, that operation was very ambitious. It was so ambitious uh, because... As- the end, I mean, we're still talking about a uh, urban area of 1.2 million people. And the armed coalition of, of Haftar was able to mobilize maybe 3,000, 4,000, maximum 5,000 fighters at a time in that particular area. I'm not talking about the forces that he has in the eastern Libya. His, some of his top backers, I'm not talking about his critics. I'm talking about the people who are supposed to agree with him. Egypt and Russia, both of them, for months, I'm talking about the, the, the period leading up to that key moment, uh, the April 4th, uh, 2019 decision to go in, uh, both expressed their skepticism. They said, this is not going to work. It's, uh, it, you're, it's just way too much compared to your capabilities. But uh, the foreign states that did help him immediately, even if it wasn't exactly the idea, were uh, the Emirates, and on the diplomatic front, military as well a little bit, but the the diplomatic front, it was France. And those two are not really in the business of being realistic in terms of measuring the military capabilities, uh, studying the geography, the demography, the political opinion, sociology, all those uh, objective parameters that you study before uh, initiating a war, a war of choice. those two basically made a big difference in terms of uh, maintaining that offensive alive, but it still didn't work. It was never able to actually breach uh, the downtown area uh, of Tripoli. The big factor here a lot of people didn't anticipate is just how effective Turkish support might be. So how important has Turkey and its drone program been to the changing tide of this conflict? In February, when I spoke to you, there was already a lot of information available about how serious Turkey was going to be. Uh, Turkey, as opposed to other meddlers, never made it a secret that it was uh, absolutely hell-bent on intervening uh, in a full-blown manner. It made its plans very public uh, as early as Christmas. And yet, uh, a lot of people, including a big portion of the Turkish population, uh, continued to underestimate Turkey. Uh, because it's uh, at, the, at the end, I mean, it's still uh, uh, an armed forces that has been growing a lot over time from a technological perspective. We all have trouble imagining a country like Turkey 
uh, possessing uh, an armed drone industry that France wouldn't even dream of or Britain wouldn't even dream of. So you have a lot of technological strength uh, that Turkey uh, knew it had. And it, of course, a lot of the reason it decided to go into uh, Libya in such a bold, brazen manner was because it knew it had a few advantages. But the public at large, particularly Western opinion, uh, particularly uh, the Europeans, underestimated uh, Turkey. So the moment I, I, we spoke last time in February, there were already signs that Libyans were being trained properly. There was a little bit more coordination. Uh, there was some optimistic signs in terms of reviving the fleet of drones that I would like to remind you, those drones uh, physically were used in 2019, but at a much lower scale. Uh, to give you an idea of uh, how swiftly uh, the environment changes, just the software of those armed drones, the Turkish ones, uh, got much better, was much better in April compared to February. And in February, it was already much better than in November. So how do you, how do you assess a situation where the technological aspect moves so fast? Uh, but yet, I still think there's a lot of, uh, um, there was a lot of the skepticism that prevented Europeans from realizing that Turkey was, was going to prevail. Uh, has to do with the fact that it's a uh, non-Western Islamic country and people forget that it has a real economy, it has a real industry, it has a real military tradition with a proper doctrine. All those qualities, um, the backers of Haftar, the principal ones, uh, don't have them. Uh, I'm referring to the United Arab Emirates. It's not really a demography. It doesn't really have an army. It doesn't really have the military experience of, uh, of Turkey. And maybe it will have um, an arms industry 15 years from now, 20 years from now, but it's, it doesn't have it. It has to use like some uh, inferior drones bought from China. Uh, and it, it certainly doesn't have the, the savvy and the comprehensiveness in terms of approach that uh, Turkey was able to display. So, you know, I, in February, I was already giving some interviews saying we have to be prepared to the scenario where uh, Turkey is able to expel the army of uh, Haftar out of Tripolitania. And when I was saying that, I looked like a, a goofball. You know, I sounded like a crazy dude, but it turned out to, to materialize. And the reason I was saying it is because by speaking to the Libyans on the ground, you could see, you know, week from week that their morale was um, being beefed up, not because they were being poetic, it's because they were being trained. They were seeing concrete signs that in terms of artillery, in terms of uh, coordination in terms of integrating those uh, thousands of Syrian mercenaries that uh, Turkey injected in, into Libya, who are probably going to stay forever, by the way. I mean, in terms of putting all those pieces together, the Libyans on the ground were giving me a lot of indications that it was actually working out. So as a bit of a refresher, can you take us through each side? And we'll start with the GNA. Who are they and who's supporting the GNA's war effort? It's effectively uh, a very motley, diverse patchwork of uh, forces that were actually bickering and, and, and fighting each other before uh, Marshal Haftar showed up. The bottom line is that the GNA uh, is effectively the one in favor of, of, of more pluralistic arrangements, more questioning of the old order under Muammar Gaddafi. Uh, and I would basically put in that basket, very uh, uh, weird, arcane basket that sometimes, uh, you know, has, as I said earlier, conflicts inside it. But by and large, I would put all the forces, all the political forces that tend to uh, uh, question this idea of, of a very uh, vertical uh, governance system where you have no freedom. And where do they get their funding from? You see, uh, oil prices were very high in the 2000s. And in 2004, uh, Muammar Gaddafi at the time uh, saw all the uh, various sanctions uh, lifted, which, uh, which was a nice coincidence because the, the sanctions, the US-driven sanctions, uh, 
because of the Lockerbie incident in uh, December 1988. Because of that, he was basically under sanctions for for like uh, roughly a decade. And when all these sanctions were lifted, it corresponded to a time where oil prices kept going higher and higher. Uh, and that gave rise to a decade during which Gaddafi, uh, through his iron fist, was able to hold the country without spending a lot. And as a result, saved uh, more than $100 billion. And out of that $100 billion, roughly half is still around. Uh, so you always must imagine that unlike Yemen, unlike Syria, unlike Lebanon, that are completely broke, Libya is not broke. It has multiple dozens of billions of dollars. And uh, it doesn't mean that it can go out and just spend them for no reason. Like all of this is in dollars. And, and um, Washington has sway, a little bit of sway over uh, the central bank in Tripoli. But my short answer is that Tripoli is rich. Uh, again, it doesn't mean that it just spends uh, loosely because uh, this is money that is, is not going to return. It's uh, even when production and exports are happening, which they are not now since uh, Gen Generate has been uh, blockaded. This is a separate issue. But even when uh, the oil industry of Libya actually operates very well, uh, the country tends to um, fund itself, but doesn't uh, cannot save money anymore. Not like uh, 20 years ago, 15 years ago. But that sweet spot, you know, the years from 2003 to 2010, uh, saw a lot of money being saved, and that chunk of money is still around. And who funds the eastern side, Haftar and his campaign? You have a much uh, more... A, big, a bigger role played by uh, the generosity of foreign states, uh, especially when it comes to delivery of weapons. Uh, to give you an idea, this year only, roughly 100 cargo planes uh, have landed either in Western Egypt or Eastern Libya for the benefit of the armed coalition of uh, Khalifa Haftar. Uh, he has paid for none of it. So we're probably talking about more than a billion dollars a year uh, spent uh, in this form of uh, military uh, resources that uh, are sent, uh, in, you know, sent to Eastern Libya. And that is paid by other people. That's through the kind, kindness of strangers. I'm referring to the Emirates primarily. So Libya is actually a really interesting battlefield from a general's perspective, because although the country is very large in size, most of the major cities are along the coast. In fact, most of the important battles of this war have all been along one major highway, the one that goes from one side of the country to the other, hugging along the Libyan coast. In my mind, this would alter how you plan the war very drastically, because rather than being able to easily go around the city and just push on into your enemy's rear, it forces you into capturing cities along the highway so you can maintain your supply chain in this one important lifeline of a highway. Uh, would you say that's correct? Yeah, you're right. I mean, everything you said is absolutely correct. Um, it's, uh, it's not densely populated. You know, to give you an idea, just the, the southwestern province in Libya is uh, three times as large as uh, the whole of Syria. And in that area, you have less than 500,000 people. Uh, I'm talking about the, the southwestern province of uh, Libya called the Fuzan. So you... And, and this has uh, implications uh, when it comes to uh, military and geostrategic considerations. Sometimes you have a strategic asset and you're trying to hold on to it. And if the enemy is able to uh, push you out, then you lose all of a sudden hundreds and hundreds of kilometers because there's nothing in between and there's nothing to hold on to. Uh, and th this, that explains why you have very bloody uh, battles like the one that might uh, erupt over the next uh, day or two in CERT. Because the reason it's important is not because CERT is tremendously important. It's because, you know, if they if Haftar loses CERT, then there's nothing after that until an even more important uh, territory called the Oil Croissant, which is strategic because of all the reasons. So now that the battle lines have reached CERT, who is defending it? Is it all Libyans or do they have foreign support in there as well? The vast majority of the work militarily speaking, that has been done since uh, June 5th. June 5th is, is the moment when uh, the offensive of Haftar collapsed in uh, the Tripoli area. Um, so since June 5th, uh, 
all that defense work, if you will, this uh, effort that consists in trying to uh, protect Cert and making sure that it stays on the side of Haftar, the overwhelming majority of that work was done by the Russians. And what I mean by the Russians, I, of course, refer to the roughly 2,500 uh, Russian mercenaries that are still in Libya. In addition to that, you have to add roughly 1,400 Syrian mercenaries on the side of Haftar and uh, another 3,000 Sudanese mercenaries. And uh, the Sudanese mercenaries are more and more coordinated by, by, by Wagner uh, this year, as opposed to Haftar himself. They, they basically said, we can continue helping you, but we, want, we, we, like, we like the Sudanese ability to fight and we want them under our command. So they basically coordinate the, the Syrians and the, and the Sudanese. And this is effectively the army that has been uh, doing most of the work, not all. You have native brigades insert. Uh, you have also a couple of brigades from Benghazi that actually mobilized and are trying to genuinely help. Um, now, Turkey is completely capable of uh, going in there. And of course, uh, the GNA itself is also equally convinced that it should try military to grab CERT. However, this is a very uh, bloody proposition because if they do initiate the, the assault, which could happen any hour now, or at least any day now, uh, you can be sure that to basically complete that effort, you need to make sure you have found a few hundred or, or, or at least, you know, 500 or 600 Libyans willing to die because uh, the, the battlefield is very lethal uh, owing to the snipers, the Russian snipers, the Russian mines, uh, the, um, the, the experience of 2016 with Daesh. Um, reminds us that it, this this third thing is, is going to be very difficult to achieve. So does the political will of actually giving it a, a try, does it exist in Tripoli and Misrata? Yes. Does it exist in Ankara? Oh, yes. But it doesn't mean that it's easy and uh, it doesn't mean that it's going to be uh, cheap. It's not that it's going to be a cheap effort. In fact, it's going to cost a lot of lives, even being optimistic. Libya has become a very crowded battlefield, with Russia, Turkey, the UAE, Egypt, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, France, Italy, and Sudan entering the fight, each of which is seeking something completely different from the outcome of the war. But why Libya? What is so important here that all of these countries would send their soldiers thousands of miles away to fight for a cause that often seems to not directly affect them? Well, for that, we turn to our next guest. Part two, all in. The war has dramatically shifted, I think, because of the internationalization of the of the conflict, and specifically the injection of massive uh, foreign forces on the ground and in the air. Uh, you know, Libya is often described as a as a proxy conflict in which. Libyans are doing the fighting with outside powers, providing them weapons and support. But what has changed, what is so significant about this war is that the outside powers are now directly fighting one another. Um, so, so what you have is mercenaries, foreign mercenaries, aligned to the warring sides, squaring off uh, on the battlefield, and foreign jets flying around. These are jets that, or drones that are piloted by foreign personnel. So this, I think, has changed the dynamic you know, completely. And aside from that, there's been a number of other dramatic uh, battlefield uh, shifts, specifically to Heftar's disadvantage. I mean, his ab ambitions for conquering Tripoli have been altogether uh, diminished. Frederick Wary is a senior fellow at the Carnegie Center, specializing in the Middle East. He's written for publications like the New York Times, the London Book Review, and Time Magazine, as well as his own book on the Libyan Civil War. He has just returned from Libya himself, and he joins us today. Right. Well, he received a significant boost uh, with the arrival of um, hundreds of Russian mercenaries from the so-called Wagner Group um, in the fall of last year. And, and so that really gave him a boost. And for the first time, he could have conceivably taken uh, 
Tripoli. What really reversed his fortunes was uh, starting in late December, you had the arrival of the Turks to help out Heftar's opponents, the, the uh, government of national accord. And the Turkish forces came in the, in the form of thousands of Syrian mercenaries. These are Syrian militia groups that enjoyed Turkish support during the civil, uh, Syrian civil war. I met some of them on the front lines in Tripoli, many of them battle-hardened, some of them uh, fairly fresh. We can talk about their composition later. And in addition to these mercenaries, there was Turkish equipment, and that really made the difference. So artillery, drones, intelligence assets, and that combination of the injection of high-tech weaponry plus the Syrian fighters uh, on the front line, what it did is it, it stabilized the front line at first. It froze it, and then it allowed the government of national accord forces to push back Heftar's uh, fighters well out of the Tripoli region uh, earlier this year. I want to get a better idea on why these countries are choosing to be involved in this conflict. What is Italy hoping to gain from supporting the GNA? Italy obviously has a concern in, in staunching the flow of migrants and has engaged in very uh, controversial and I think ultimately unhelpful uh, strategy of basically paying off militias in the Tripoli region that are nominally affiliated with the GNA. So that's that's the sort of engagement of Italy's um, part. And of course, the Italians have operated a field hospital, but I think the main contribution of the Italians has been diplomatic uh, support. I mean, when I talked to the GNA back in, um, well, in January of this year, when they received the help from the Syrians and the Turks, they, they said, look, we didn't want to turn to the Turks, but they were our only friend. I mean, they were the only ones that would help us substantially on the battlefield. And what is Turkey hoping to gain at the end of all of this? The Turks have had longstanding uh, interests in Libya. I mean, obviously, uh, on, a, well, on a number of levels. Of course, before the 2011 revolution, the Turks enjoyed a lot of economic access in the form of infrastructure contracts. Turkish workers were present in, in uh, Libyan cities. Of course, they lost a lot of that economic uh, access with the revolution. They were supporting uh, various Libyan factions in, in different sorts of fighting uh, from 2014 onward. Many of these factions were Islamist, so Turkey has some ideological affinity between its own Islamist government under President Erdogan and Libyan Islamists. But I don't think that's the primary driver. I think the primary driver for its recent intervention in late 2019 and its current role is, is really geopolitical. It's part of a broader uh, militarization, assertiveness on the part of Erdogan that we see obviously in Syria. It's part of his Mediterranean strategy, this so-called blue homeland strategy that we see uh, Turkish expansion in the Mediterranean, even penetration into Africa. Um, but very specifically, the Turks' uh, help to the GNA was transactional. You know, they, they supplied that weaponry and they got something back in return, specifically in the form of rights, gas exploration rights to offshore hydrocarbon fields in the eastern Mediterranean that really... Um, upset the geopolitics of the Mediterranean basin because it infringed on a rival consortium, gas consortium, that included Cyprus, Greece, Egypt, and Israel. Someone we haven't spoken about a lot in this episode is Egypt. Egypt has been very vocal in its support of Haftar's forces, even stating recently at a press conference that if Sirte were to be invaded by the GNA, Egypt would send in its national army to assist Haftar's. What are the Egyptians hoping to gain from all of this? Well, again, after the, um, the coup d'etat that put Sisi in power in 2013, um, I think Egypt, the Egyptian regime, saw in Heftar an ideological ally. Again, Heftar is very anti-Islamist, anti-Muslim Brotherhood. The Egyptians were concerned about Islamists in neighboring Libya. So there's the ideological dimension, the anti-Islamist dimension, but again, Heftar, you know, with his power base in eastern Libya, he has the ability to secure Egypt's border with Libya, which has always been very porous. There's Egyptian concern about that border and as a thoroughfare for arms, jihadists, smugglers. So Heftar was a, was a useful ally on that border to a point, and I want to underscore that. We cannot say that 
Egypt has a love affair with Heftar, that they give him carte blanche, and that they've backed his attack on Tripoli. The Emirates actually were quite, I think, um, disgruntled and dismayed at Heftar's move on the Egyptian, on the Libyan capital. And what about Moscow? What is Putin hoping to gain from a Haftar victory in Libya? The Russians have been cultivating Haftar for quite some time. Um, you know, going back to the 2016, 2017 time frame where you had a very theatrical visit by Haftar on board a Russian aircraft carrier off the Libyan coast. You had Russian mercenaries helping Haftar in one of his attacks on an eastern uh, oil field or oil field in central uh, Libya. So and the Russians have been printing um, fake dinars, banknotes to keep Heftar's government in the east afloat. But again, to a point, um, the Russians were always very leery and suspicious of Heftar's ability to, uh, to to rule the country, his his competence as a military commander. They didn't think very highly of him. And speaking to Russia experts is that it's pure opportunism. I mean, Russia... Russia saw a vacuum. He saw that after the fall of Muammar Gaddafi, the U.S. was disinterested. Uh, the Europeans were divided, um, not not entirely engaged. You had this civil war erupt. You had chaos. It was a key opportunity for Russia to come in, stir things up, to try to steer this conflict in a way that a settlement would play to Russia's economic advantage. And I think the economic angle is important in the sense that under the late dictator Muammar Gaddafi, Russia enjoyed, you know, a huge arms market. They had infrastructure contracts. They had, you know, this 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 economic boon in in Libya, and of course they lost that. Uh, and so I think they do have um, an economic uh, angle in mind with a lot of this. But it's also, um, you know, geopolitical. Any chance they get to give the Europeans a black eye to stir things up. On, on the southern flank of, of NATO, you know, there, there is a, a very real fear in the Africa, Africa Command, the U.S. Uh, military command responsible for Libya, that Russia is set, setting up a military infrastructure uh, just south of Europe that will include hardened fighter bases, uh, fourth generation aircraft, air defense system. You know, again, this this is alarming, but the parallel is often drawn to Syria, that Russia's replicating Syria its strategy in Syria and Libya. And, and the two situations are completely different because, um, first of all, Russia has a long history going back in Syria with engaging the Syrian military. They're full in behind Assad. In no way does President Assad equate to Heftar. Again, as, as I've just stated, the Russians are, take a very dim view of Heftar and they are exploring you know, other, other options in, in Libya. So everyone agrees that invading Serb will take the war to a whole new level and escalate things for both sides. So do you think the Turks will roll the dice on that and push their troops in, or we're going to see just this be the status quo and this is where the war stops? It's going to depend on a lot of factors. I mean, at one level, it's the diplomatic um, you know, aspect and the will of the opposing powers and specifically Turkey to push forward. Um they, it's going to require, you know, heavy uh, f- boots on the ground, heavy fighting, you know, to go into Sirte. Sirte is a notoriously difficult urban environment. We saw that in the 2011 uh, revolution, the last stages of the revolution, it was the final holdout for uh, pro Qaddafi forces, very uh, brutal fighting, a lot of artillery. And then also it was the holdout for the Islamic State and the site of a months long campaign in 2016. So, so combat in Sirte is, is a slog. And I think the GNA, you know, they have to get the right mix of Libyan militias. They have to secure Turkish support. And it's unclear to me, um, you know, where Turkey has drawn the line with Russia, what kind of backroom deals are being negotiated as we speak. The Turks are also cognizant of the move into uh, across CERT and what that will, what kind of message that will send to Egypt. Egypt has threatened to intervene on its own, although the assessment of a lot of analysts is it won't go very far into eastern Libya. But again, there's a very careful sort of diplomatic dance that is being uh, played out here by these great powers that are backing the Libyan factions. 
Egypt has threatened to push its troops into Libya and fight alongside Haftar for the Battle of Sirte, but their war record over the last century hasn't been fantastic. Do you think Egypt actually has the ability to turn the tide of the conflict here? Well, again, I, I don't think they have the capability to to project power very far. I think the deployment of troops would be a, a token deployment to to send a signal, to establish some notional deterrence, possibly to play out domestically for CC, you know, to show that he's he's taking this on. Um, but again, you're right, the, the Egyptian military doesn't have a great track record. When the Egyptian military has, in fact, intervened in Libya in 2014, it was it was very brief, one-off um, airstrikes, a few special operations raids. So I think I'm leery of project of taking Sisi's, you know, warning seriously. Um, you know, I think it would be to establish some sort of line. And I think the Turks, again, would respect that. The Turks do not want to conquer the whole country. They don't want to inflame things. They don't want to see the country break into two parts. The Turks actually have incentives to reach some sort of deal with Egypt uh, that would be mutually beneficial to both. Um, so again, these are all, I think, con- factors that mitigate against a real uh, clash between these two, these two sides. With Turkey being a member of NATO and Russia on the other side of this conflict, this thing could pretty easily slide out of control here. Uh, Do you think Moscow or Ankara would allow this to escalate into other tension points between the two or just keep it compartmentalized to Libya? No, that's that's a great question. And and I I, I just don't know. My sense is they've they've compartmentalized it, but they're also leery of directly engaging each other um, on the Libyan battlefield. Um, You know, so far, I mean, I I think there have been instances Instances where, the, you know, for instance, I mean, some Syrian mercenaries that were supported by Turkey said they killed some Russian snipers. They told me that. I mean, there's been some one-offs, and there were recently some uh, Turkish airstrikes on Russian positions. But a huge, massive, you know, head-on-head, head-to-head conflict between the Russians and Turkish forces. I, I just think there are larger geopolitical stakes for both that they would not want to jeopardize. I mean, the Russians need the Turks as allies for various uh, economic and strategic reasons. So again, it's, it's a careful dance. For instance, when the, when the Turks, um, you know, Turkish-backed GNA forces swept out of the Tripoli region and were pushing back Heftar's forces, the Wagner forces, you know, withdrew as well and in a way that seemed to indicate there was some sort of deal where the Turkish drone would not target those retreating Wagner forces. So again, it speaks to that that you know very delicate relationship between Ankara and Moscow. Well, now turning back over to the United States, who are notably absent from this conflict, why do you think the Trump administration is so eager to stay out of this one? Well, there's always been a reticence. Um, I mean, it goes actually back to the overthrow of Muammar Gaddafi in 2011, where you know, the, the policy of the Obama administration is like, look, we we provided the assets for the NATO-led operation, but the, the what comes after needs to be owned by the Libyans, by the United Nations, by the Europeans. And of course, that strategy or assumption fell through and Libya descended into chaos. And then, of course, you had the tragic 2012 Benghazi attack, which made Libya politically radioactive in Washington. Um, and then just the broader sense that you know, this is a European problem, given Libya's geographic uh, proximity. Um, of course, this changes a bit with the arrival of the Trump administration because Trump is influenced by President Sisi of Egypt and by the Emirates, you know, especially on the sort of anti-Islamist angle. And there's that famous uh, phone call that Trump made to Heftar in 2019, April 2019. And then, of course, the phone call between then National Security Advisor John Bolton and Heftar, in which Bolton essentially gave Heftar the green light for his operation. Now, that's been dialed back a bit. Why? Because of the Russians. So, you know, Heftar's project in the beginning was, okay, you know, the or the U.S. attitude was, okay, just, just make it quick, get this done. But then suddenly, Heftar invites the Russians in. And this is obviously a huge concern to AFRICOM and other, 
you know, U.S. entities. And I think that's really motivated the U.S. to pay greater attention, but not necessarily take action. And so we're not seeing any bold diplomacy. Um, why? Because we're in an election season. Again, November's on the horizon. Um, there's some movement in Congress in terms of sanctions on Heftar and sanctions on the Wagner forces. But you're, you know, you've got an embassy, a U.S. embassy that's not in Tripoli, it's basically a caretaker embassy there. They're doing some things around the edges. But again, American ambivalence and tacit support for the Emirates and for Heftar's project has been part of the problem, why this conflict reached this stage that it has. Now, with the Turkish intervention, the, the, I think the U.S. position is sort of like, well, the Turks are here. You know, we're not enamored with the Turks, but at least they stop the Tripoli government from falling. They've stabilized the line. And the Turkish intervention ironically created an opening for a return to a political process. And so U.S. diplomats are trying to manage the Turkish intervention in a way that avoids greater escalation and returns us to some sort of political talks. When it comes to press conferences, Haftar usually invites Egyptian President Sisi to speak right there alongside him. It would appear like Egypt's looking to play a bigger part in the conflict. But is Egypt really as important as it makes itself out to be, or are they just parroting talking points from Moscow and Abu Dhabi? Being that Egypt is a direct neighbor of Libya's, optics-wise, it might look better than having someone from far away like Russia speak next to Haftar. Uh, would you agree with that statement? I think you're right. The optics, you know, I mean, Haftar has appeared in Egypt for various statements and and of course there's there's obviously the proximity a lot of um i mean a lot of ties tribal ties uh, especially with ex Qaddafis residing in in cairo um I, my sense is the the egyptians you know they provided important um you know diplomatic cover but they were really a way station and a thoroughfare for for the real muscle that was coming through to help Heftar, and that's, that's from the Emirates um, and also Russia. The French were heavily involved with the early stages of this conflict, but they seem to be taking somewhat of a back seat now. Why are the French much less involved in Libya these days? Multiple, um, you know, multiple reasons. Again, the um, French uh, at least notionally supported the UN-backed uh, government in Tripoli, but clandestinely and increasingly overtly, they've been supporting Heftar. And, and you know, when Heftar was waging war against Islamists in Benghazi um, around the 2016 time frame, the French gave him uh, covert intelligence support with advisors. Some of them were actually killed supporting him. And so the French have always played a double-faced um, game. You know, why is this? I think it's partly out of a misplaced notion that Heftar is a counter-terrorist ally, that he's you know, cleaning up uh, terrorists and Islamists. And he's also could be helpful in securing Libya's southern borders, which matters because France has interests in the Sahel countries to the south um, of Libya. You know, this differs from the U.S. position where the U.S., when Heftar comes on the scene in 2014, is in Benghazi, the U.S. is saying, look, Heftar is going after some bad guys, but he's also going after broader political opponents, you know, Islamists that we don't qualify as or count as terrorists. And moreover, Heftar is not part of the government. So the position of the Obama administration is we're not giving him active aid unless he subordinates himself to the government. And the French never had those reservations. So they were always backing Heftar. I think there's also a strong, you know, ideological alignment that they, you know, Macron likes a strong man. He likes seeing strong men in power in Africa. Um, and that also aligns uh, the French with the Emirates. So the French have been working very closely with the Emirates on their Libya um, Libya policy. Can you see any sort of political solution to this war? As long as you've got foreign forces on the battlefield, it's hard for me to see, you know, movement on the Libyan political front that Libyans can reach some arrangement while they've got foreign backers on their soil. And so the huge sticking point is what happens to these foreign fighters? What happens to the Syrian mercenaries? Are they going to be some sort of monitoring force? Are they going to go home? It's a huge stumbling block because it's politically impossible right now for Eastern 
forces that were aligned with Heftar to agree to a settlement while there's, you know, these Syrians on Libyan soil. And, and likewise with the Russians. Again, um, you know, have, having these Russians on, on the soil, on Rush, Libyan soil is a huge, um, huge irritant. I mean, a threat, I think, for, for the country's um, future and certainly a, a concern for the United States. Increasingly, Ankara and Moscow are expanding their reaches all over the Mediterranean. Russia now has naval bases in places like Syria, and Turkey still occupies half of the nation of Cyprus. Both of these nations' naval routes travel through the eastern Mediterranean, so whomever can control it will have a huge advantage over the other one. But how do Moscow and Ankara plan to do that? What are their overall regional objectives? Well, for that, we turn to our next guest. Part 3. Playing Chicken with Turkeys well, first, Libya is a very large country right on the Mediterranean. Uh, it is one of the uh, most substantial producers of oil in the world. And uh, its oil, Libya Sweet Crude, is uh, one of the, uh, the best oils for all kinds of um, uses. So it has an economic importance. The strategic importance is that it is right on the Mediterranean and stability or chaos in Libya affects not only its North African neighbors, but its EU neighbors, in particular France and Italy. Jonathan Viner was the former Assistant Secretary of State for the Obama administration and a senior fellow at the Middle East Institute. Jonathan was the head of the US's Libya strategy, meeting frequently with everyone from Obama to Putin to Haftar himself. He knows most of the actors in this theater personally, and he joins us today. Well. It was always clear to us in the United States, in the Obama administration, after as Haftar was telling us, that he intended to take the entire country by conquest, uh, that it would be a disaster for the country. His vision was based on what he had experienced being part of Gaddafi's coup back in the 1960s. And he was trying to correct the arc of history by replacing Gaddafi as the, the new dictator. It's kind of like he thought to himself in the 70s, uh, it should have been me. It should have been me. So why are the Emiratis putting so much money into this conflict, even though it's fairly far away and they have all the oil they could ever need? Is there an overall strategy from the Emiratis here? The Emiratis, who did not want a Muslim Brotherhood government controlling Libya's wealth um, being able to export Muslim Brotherhoodism uh, to other countries, including in the Gulf, had just helped install the El Sisi government um, to replace the Morsi government, putting a lot of money into it, and saw an opportunity to potentially replicate it in Libya. Um, meanwhile, Qatar and Turkey were working with Islamist elements to have potentially have a Turkish-like model where Erdogan has used Islamism as a force to potentially create a, a new Ottoman Empire kind of uh, idea. Um, and the Qataris were using the game book, the, the playbook that originally had been developed by the Saudis uh, in the late 70s and 1980s, which was support all um, everybody who's a Muslim everywhere. And that way you'll be taken care of and protected and have some power. And that was the old Saudi playbook, which the Saudis continued until 2003, when the um, Islamist uh, terrorists attacked them in Riyadh. And they recognized that not only was the United States under threat in Europe, but they were too. And they stopped, largely, what they'd been doing before. So the Qataris uh, took that old Saudi playbook. The Erdogan uh, did his... An effort to resurrect Ottoman uh, authority in old Ottoman territories. The Emiratis sought to replicate what they had done in Egypt and put in place a dictator who they could um, uh, work with. And everybody with the, and the terrorists, meanwhile, wanted an Islamic state but without any borders at all. So all of these forces um, put their ideological agendas into play in Libya. What else do you think the Russians can gain from Libya? I mean, is it just warm water ports 
or a platform to project power and intelligence into Southern Europe and Northern Africa? Uh, I think it's not clear uh, what the extent of Russia's ambitions are with Libya. I assume in an ideal world, it would love to have a Libyan government in which it is the principal ally of the Libyan government for military purposes. It can sell lots of weapons to Libya, regardless of the fact that there's a UN arms embargo, which it has uh, grossly violated without consequences of any kind from the United States or, or anyone else. Um, having that kind of a primary military relationship would allow it greater power and authority throughout North Africa, potentially beyond to the Sahel to the south, potentially um, uh, into the east, uh, affecting its uh, relationship with Egypt. And it's just a great base. It's also right on um, a Europe's doorstep in terms of um, it for intelligence gathering purposes, uh, for, you know, for, for basing um, intelligence assets of various kinds. So there's all kinds of potential benefits. At minimum, it provides a political power to influence events that it didn't have before. So uh, Donald Trump has been very, very good uh, for Vladimir Putin. Um, he's been good for Vladimir Putin in Libya. He's been good for Vladimir Putin in Syria. He's been good for Vladimir Putin in Ukraine. He's been good for Vladimir Putin in relationship to um, uh, NATO, uh, in relationship to Venezuela, um, in, in reducing U.S. activity there. It's been an extremely successful relationship for Mr. Putin and the Kremlin. I, I can't think of anything that the United States gets out of it. And in this case, hundreds of thousands of Libyans have been forced out of their homes and become um, displaced persons. And many thousands of Libyans have died in substantial part as a result of Russia's ambitions. And what is Turkey's wider strategy for Libya? As mentioned before, Libya was part of the Ottoman Empire. Um, it was ruled by um, the Turkish Ottomans for hundreds of years. And their commercial ties between Turkey and Libya, which have been extensive in the 20th century. Uh, it's a major oil producer and it's got oil and gas offshore. And it gives, it, this relationship gives Turkey the ability to push back against Greece uh, on oil and ga uh, gas issues and to generally flex its muscles um, politically as a result of this relationship. And the government of national accord, the Tripoli based government, has been so dependent. Um, Turkish military support, um, that it has given Turkey concessions in this area, which, by the way, I think is a very bad idea geopolitically, because if you do that, um, you run the risk of Libya in turn um, getting pushback and hostility from Greece and uh, pushback and hostility from France and becoming a plaything of big power politics. And that's not in Libya's interest. Libya's interest should be in making sure that it's not divided up or partitioned and becoming a playground for other people's ambitions. So you know, the dependence of this government on the Turkish military um, uh, pushback of Haftar has had some unfortunate consequences, even as it uh, played a substantial role in ending Haftar's ability to try and take the country. So one of the major wild cards here is the Jufra Air Base in the central Libyan desert. The base is located behind where the front line sits today, but way out in the desert, and is currently occupied by large amounts of Russian anti-aircraft missile batteries, Wagner soldiers, Russian personnel, as well as up to 30 Gen 4 MiG-29 fighters, far more advanced than anything currently fighting in the battle. Right now, Russia is keeping its powder dry and Jufra hasn't really been used to its full potential. But if Sirt is attacked, the Russians may deploy their lethal forces from Jufra, attacking Turkish bases and ports. If the Turks were to go for the first strike here, it will eliminate a threat to their rear areas. But it will mean killing Russian soldiers and pilots in the open. Do you think Turkey will shore up their lines and attack the Jufra airbase, eliminating Moscow's air power? or prioritize a better relationship with Moscow for negotiations on other theaters? Well, Ankara and Moscow have many different interests with one another, certainly including Turkish, Turkey's border with Syria. 
their ability to uh, work out arrangements that both countries can live with or to inflict misery on one another um, uh, should be evident to both countries. I know that Mr. Erdogan and Mr. Putin talk frequently. It's, it's constantly re reported that they've just had another conversation or meeting. Um, what takes place in those meetings, I don't know. Um, but I think that they, they both know a lot about one another's interests and intentions. And uh, there may be some interest there uh, in maintaining the uh, primary roles with their respective clients in Libya. In my personal opinion, it's not in the interest of any Libyan to have Turkey and Russia divide up the country. If a push on cert was successful and it was captured militarily, there's not much after that down the highway before you reach the Haftar's capital in Benghazi. Uh, do you think Haftar's troops would likely hold out to the end or fade away once cert fell, knowing that Benghazi would likely be doomed? Well, if the government of the National Accord took cert militarily, it would raise the question about the governance of Benghazi. Benghazi is now being run more or less as a military dictatorship. Haftar told me the way in which government was going to work in any territory he controlled was he would put military governors in charge of the city and let the civilians run education and health care and that kind of thing and get rid of all of Libya's politicians until Libya was ready for um, democracy at some future year, at which time Haftar would retire back to his barracks. That's what Haftar told me was his vision. People have told me that's how Benghazi's been working. Cairo has once again found itself on the side of Russia. Uh, do you think that's just a real friendship of convenience or an old relic from the Cold War? And would Egypt maybe be better off siding with Turkey for a more stable Middle Eastern region? Well, I if Turkey and Egypt could improve their relationship, uh, that would be good for everybody. Because uh, the, the mutual um, uh, hostility between those countries uh, is a barrier to broader stability in the region. There's no reason for Egypt to feel threatened by Turkey or vice versa. They both had to ha have had strong militaries over a long period of time. Um, Turkey is in some sense under Erdogan Islamists. I personally believe that's unfortunate. It's a negative. Um, I think that Erdogan has not uh, behaved in a particularly democratic fashion. He is an authoritarian leader who has used religion to move Turkey away from the secularism that was uh, adopted under um, Ataturk and which moved the country ahead for decades. And can you see any sort of peaceful solution to this conflict? Turkey's engagement and getting Haftar's forces defeated has had uh, negative consequences and pushing a, a negative Greek response to Turkey's ambitions uh, and uh, a negative French response and threatening the risk of potential partition, which would be also catastrophic. Libya's oil doesn't line up with east and west and south. It traverses all three regions. It traverses the, the number of provinces that are in um, Libya, which is not just the three regions, different numbers depending on which period you use of provinces. You can't neatly divide the country up. Um, that's not going to work. I don't think Libyans want it. Maybe some of the politicians do, but it won't work. Uh, so what has to happen now is Egypt, the Emirates, Russia, Turkey, all need, and France, all need to step back, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, from the idea that they can pick who's going to be the leader of Libyan's government or what kind of government Libya is going to have. There need to be Libyan to Libyan discussions which involve compromise over how wealth is shared and how national institutions are built or rebuilt, how you foster the maximum amount of oil um, development and, and export to fund um, uh, the basics for every Libyan, to put money in every Libyan's pocket and to provide resources to every Libyan city so they can provide services um, to ordinary Libyans. If you do that, you're giving every Libyan a stake in the country and continued stability and the production of oil, and you're giving a stake uh, to every city in the country, every region of the country at a local level, that unity 
and an agreed upon set of political and economic compromises provides benefits to them and that nobody's telling them what to do. Nobody at home and nobody overseas. Rather, there's a common agreement on sharing the national wealth with the entire country on a per capita basis. For the Russians, Libya can give them a lot of things. For one, a warm water port on the southern Mediterranean, allowing a port either side of the crucial Suez Canal. It will give them control of the second biggest migrant jumping off point into Europe. A weapon that wielded correctly will permit them to increase migrant flows into Europe and stoke racial tensions in the EU by boosting the platforms of far-right, almost always pro-Russia, anti-EU parties. Parties that coincidentally quite often have breaking up the EU as part of their policy platform. It would also give the Russians more clout with its major financial partners in the UAE and a jumping off point for further projections into Algeria, Tunisia and the Greater Sahel, all nations where France's once iron grip is slowly slipping away. For the Turks, it brings back what was once an incredibly important jewel in the Ottoman crown. It provides them naval bases to accompany the ones in northern Cyrus, and hopefully the ability to be a major naval player in the east of the Mediterranean. Rather than feeling trapped in by the Greeks and the Italians, this may turn the tables on that. It also earns them amazing oil and gas deals, and a possible renegotiation of the Turkish EZ. Resources Turkey will desperately need to power its projected growth over the next few decades. Most of all, it gives them clout, as a regional power who can project over vast distances. Nations in Africa and the Middle East now look at Turkey as possibly a powerful ally to cozy up to. We don't know who the winner of all this will be. We may do another episode another five months time with the tide once again turned. All we can be sure of though, is that the losers of this war will be the average Libyan citizens who have suffered through almost a decade of brutal civil wars, terrorist uprisings, and foreign interventions. Tripoli was once one of the greatest cities in Africa, and hopefully, we will eventually see those days return. Thank you so much to everyone who tuned in this week. I do highly recommend you go back and check out our earlier piece on the Libyan civil war from February. We go back through a lot more of the history, Gaddafi, the Arab Spring, and how the war kicked off. Jalel and Jonathan were both part of that episode and were some of the first to point out that the tide could turn. But if you want to help out the show even more, you can donate to our Patreon at www.theredlinepodcast.com. Every dollar we get goes straight back into the show to write transcripts, fund editing, chase bigger stories, and hopefully eventually turn these episodes into video documentaries as well. Every dollar really helps. And personally, I thank each and every person who has already donated to the show. You are what makes this possible. You can also support the show by liking, subscribing, and sharing the podcast on social media, or following us on Twitter on at the Red Line Pod. You can also find me on Twitter at Mike Hilliard Oz. A huge thanks to all of our guests this week. You can find Jalel on Twitter at jmjalel underscore h. He is always sharing some of the most up-to-date data on Libya. Even my sources on Libya regularly quote Jalel's work to me, so it was an honor to have him back on the show. Frederick Wary wrote one of the best books on the subject titled The Burning Shores. He is regularly on the ground in Libya and has an amazing insight to the war you just wouldn't get unless you'd actually sat in the trenches with the fighters. We will hopefully have Frederick back on the show soon. Jonathan is one of the most consequential people you will ever meet, making decisions that shaped the entire theater for years. He knows the personalities of everyone involved, and that is something you almost never get to hear of. We were incredibly happy to have him back on the program, and you can find him on Twitter at Jonathan M. Viner. Another big thanks goes out to our second editor, Joe, who helps us clean up the audio to sound as good as it does. His work has been absolutely amazing so far, and we're very happy to have him on. We also can't forget about Mark, who provides the additional vocals for these episodes. Mark has been one of the earliest supporters of the show, and we are forever grateful for his immense help. We'll be back next week with another international episode. But for now, thank you, and good night.